Uh, hello. Um, my name is Lauren Duveras, and I'm a member of the Future Forum board. Um, on behalf of the Future Forum, I want to thank you all for joining us today. Um, and I also want to offer a quick thank you to our sponsors, the Downtown Austin Alliance and FVF Law. The Future Forum's events are made possible by our incredible members and sponsors. The Future Forum brings together individuals with different backgrounds, experiences, and points of view to discuss local, statewide, national, and international topics that affect us today. Our goal is to create civil, informed, and bipartisan discussions. If you're not a member, I strongly encourage you to sign up before you leave. Members enjoy the best of what Future Forum has to offer, including first access to events and happy hours, networking opportunities, and benefits at the LBJ Presidential Library. Our next event will be a discussion on artificial intelligence called Seeking Truth in an AI World, Surviving Deepfakes, Deception, and Discrimination. Um, and we'll have that event next month. And on December 5th, we'll gather for our member holiday reception. Each year, the Future Forum hosts a discussion on women in leadership, a series which has explored a variety of topics, including building diverse and inclusive teams, women in government featuring a conversation with Madeleine Albright, the historic mobilization of women in politics, and the next generation of change makers. This year, the Future Forum is honoring Domestic Violence Awareness Month by focusing on the women leading this important work in Austin. Most of us has very constrained ideas about what intimate partner violence is and how we address it. We tend to think of family violence as an issue entirely separate from consumer protections, from public benefits, um, from immigration, and from data and privacy. But in fact, survivors of domestic violence often navigate many of these systems while trying to build safer futures. Last week, when our Texas Ledge um, debated immigration bills uh, that were put forward during this third special session in a row, um, some of the most hard fought for and longest debated amendments attempted to consider these bills as impact on survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault. The women on this panel tonight represent a multifaceted approach to addressing the issues affecting survivors of domestic violence researchers, advocates, attorneys, and policy workers. I'm excited and honored to introduce you to our guest today. Bronwyn Blake is the Chief Legal Officer of the Texas Advocacy Project and the founder of their Teen Justice Initiative, a program that advocates for teen victims of dating violence. Krista Delgallo is the Legislative Director of the Texas Council on Family Violence. Zara Shakur Jamal is the Director of Prevention, Outreach, and Community ed Education at Asian Family Support Services of Austin. And Dr. Leela Wood is a professor at the University of Texas Medical Branch School of Nursing and the Director of Evaluation at the Center for Violence Prevention at UTMB. And moderating today's discussion is Leslie Ranhill, Emmy-nominated Morning News anchor for Good Day Austin. Please keep in mind that there will be time for questions at the end of the panel. And, uh, and now I'll hand things over to Leslie. So thank you all. <laughs> All right, everyone, thank you so much for being here this evening. It is really an honor for me to moderate this panel because I myself am a survivor of childhood domestic violence. So um, thank you, first of all, to all the women who are here doing this important work. I'd, I'd like to jump straight into the conversation. We'll start, start with you, Dr. Wood. What really led you down the path of leading this important, uh, very important work that you're doing? So. My mother worked in a domestic violence program. Uh, she ran the childcare. She started working there when I was nine. I'm from a single parent household. Uh, my big sister, who's one of my heroes, is in the audience right there, mm -hmm. uh, came to support me. <laughs> um, so our mom worked. Uh, she ran the childcare, and then later she worked with adult survivors. So I literally grew up in that shelter environment and around all of these incredible women who were doing all this leadership work in our community. And so when I was 14, I got to have my first official volunteer job. I did donations, I loved that. And then when I was 18, I finally got my first paid job and I was a prevention educator for many years. Later, I got my BSW and then my MSW here, just down the road at the Steve Hicks School. And I ran our regional crisis line and did hospital accompaniment. I've had almost every job you can imagine. But my mom provided that anchor to me. And what she installed in me was that everyone is lovable and that survivors are so much more than their victimization. They are complex, beautiful, wonderful people with strengths and interests.
she's my inspiration for the work that I do and all the women I got to learn from in, in that particular setting. Um, and it really led me to a lot of curiosity, uh, which led me to transitioning my social work practice career into a research career. Yeah, thank you so much for that. And can you briefly share with us on the panel and the audience a little bit more about your current work and, and the data that, that you are looking into right now? Yeah, of course. Uh, I'm sorry, when I start talking about my mom, I kind of, you know, I get, I get stuck there. It's beautiful, it's relevant, and it's what's led you down this path. So thank you for sharing that. Um, so I am a professor at at UTMB, and you're probably like, well, what are you doing here in Austin? So um, when they recruited me, I said, well, I'm going to have to stay living in Austin. <laughs> uh, but we have uh, folks all over the state, and what we work on is really a, a wide spectrum of research and evaluation that is community-oriented on dating violence and sexual violence prevention. And that's a spectrum of prevention from primary pr prevention, you know, stopping it before it even happens, to really preventing it from happening again to somebody. Um, and my work specifically focuses on the community-based response to domestic violence, um, particularly the over 90 programs across the state of Texas that provide free comprehensive supports to survivors of violence. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you so much for, for sharing that. We'll move on to Krista. Um, tell us a little bit more about what led you to the work that you do. Right. Well, I was a little bit anomalous in my family in terms of just from a really early age being very interested in service and social justice causes. And, and when I was thinking about my response to this answer, even though at first I thought it was really trivial because like I learned about what was happening in Central America through Miami Vice in the 80s <laughs> um, and, 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 and then talked to my teachers about it and stuff like that and, and it made me think though that's so important because so many kids are sort of plugging in in very different ways and if you get that interest, if you find someone like bring them into the fold, you know, like welcome that and really nurture that curiosity and that want to like make some change and to affect something good in the world. And um, I did a lot of volunteer work th all through high school and I got to work at a Native American art museum in our city and that really um, put me down a path of studying more in terms of indigenous people and their experience in our country. And so, and then as soon as I got to uh, Bloomington, Indiana, when I was 18 years old, I started uh, working for Leela and Molly's mom <laughs> mm -hmm. at, at the Middleway House in Bloomington, Indiana. And so I volunteered and worked there throughout college. I also was able to work at um, the first domestic violence shelter program that was built on tribal lands, White Buffalo Calf Women's Shelter, which is incredible, in Rosebud, South Dakota. And my semester, my last semester of college, I got to um, travel to Mexico, and that was my first time being out of the country um, because my family only um, traveled for Notre Dame football games. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so that was a that was also a really big eye opener. And just to see there was just so much in this world. And I really got back to Indiana, and I just decided I really didn't like the weather or the food there. Um, and so I, I came to Austin in 1998, and um, sort of through this Hoosier connection that's really beautiful um, uh, started working right at the Safe Alliance and so I've been on this track for quite a long time now. Yeah, thank you so much for that. It sounds like a, an interesting journey there. Um, tell us a little bit more about your current work as legislative director. Well, I work at the Texas Council on Family Violence with several of the amazing audience members here. Um, on the policy team, I transitioned to working um, for our statewide domestic violence coalition back in 2002, went straight from direct advocacy to um, working as uh, what was then called a public policy specialist and I remember someone asking me at Safe Place, which was what the Safe Alliance was called back then, oh my gosh, what are you going to be doing as a public policy specialist? And I said, I do not know, <laughs> but I am going to find out. And so 
21 years later, I have a much better idea of it. I think that maybe the ignorance back in 2002 was definitely a little bit of bliss. Um, and But it's been amazing to work both in policy at a statewide domestic violence coalition because it's pretty non-traditional, so we absolutely do advocate within the Texas State Legislature and within Congress, but also have a really broad reach and attention and focus to all the different systems that impact survivors. And so that's been incredible. And as Leela mentioned, we all have a very close connection to the family violence programs um, throughout the state. And so it's exciting to do policy advocacy work that is so directly connected to the field. And that's both because of our everyday conversations with program advocates, but also because of the research that, you know, that we're getting out of UTMB and the Center for Violence Prevention. So um, it's, it's a pretty swell opportunity. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you so much. And, and we'll move on to Zara. Can you tell us a little bit more about what led you to the work that you're doing at Asian Family Support Services of Austin? Yeah, absolutely. So hi everyone, my name is Zara. Um, I have been at AFSA for the last eight years, but AFSA has been serving Asian and immigrant survivors of violence in Central Texas for the last 31 years. Um, I came to AFSA after what feels like a different life. I um, went to law school, was barred in California, um, and did some legal aid work primarily with survivors of domestic violence, both in the family law space, but in other spaces. Um, and I realized that so often that um, the folks that I was seeing were not always coming from communities that I know um, had a need for legal services. And there was su such little funding, if any, for outreach to marginalized communities, uh, for folks that didn't understand the legal and criminal justice remedies that were available in this country. Um, so I found myself sort of um, thinking a lot on what it means to access justice and even the idea of justice and what it looks like in different communities. Um, I um, also think a lot about you know the clients that did come forward. A lot of them had um, just some discomfort in accessing criminal justice systems and legal remedies that we were offering at Legal Aid. Um, so we you know we we worked a lot to sort of identify partners. And for those of y'all that have been doing this work, it's really hard uh, to come across um, community organizations that have connection. Um, with the folks that uh, we wanted to reach, but also um, understood the context within which uh, those families and communities were living and how to have conversations around domestic violence and sexual violence. Um, I, in sort of my sort of, you know, thinking on how do I connect folks with services that would make this legal interaction a little safer and accessible, I came across a lot of small nonprofits in the Bay Area one was called the Asian Health Services. It was representing a client who was an, a Cambodian refugee, um, had been in the US for decades, had spent most of her adult life working as a nurse, um, and was seeing us both for um, a family law case involving domestic violence, but also an SS, a disability case. And for those of you all that are familiar with disability cases, not super trauma informed, Everybody that applies the first time gets rejected. Um, and then we were supporting our appeal. And I realized that this, and, and you know, I was a baby attorney, didn't have any experience really uh, working um, in, with, uh, with clients in, in, you know, it, in, in many ways it was a first for me as well. And I realized uh, when we found that she had an advocate at Asian Health Services that could be in community with her as we were asking her to share the details of violence that she'd experienced as a child, to share the details of violence that she had experienced in this decades-long relationship that she was now exiting. Uh, it made all the difference to have this person that she trusted, that spoke the language that she spoke, um, and her legal outcomes were much better uh, because as a direct result of that. So when I was thinking about um, leaving the practice of law, I was pretty sure that I wanted to be at an organization that um, could partner 
with legal aid and other partners, but really thinking on how do we make services accessible? And also, what are the opportunities when criminal justice systems are not the way someone is seeking healing or justice, right? So, um, so I was really, um, so that's kind of what's kept me in the movement, what brought me to the movement, really thinking about what meaningful access looks like and how <laughs> certainly beyond language access, what are ways or what are the barriers that, that are keeping people outside of services? Um, so I'll pause there. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that. And, and, and from what you shared, is that a large part of, of what your role is currently at AFSA? It is, it is. So AFSA is, I do not serve clients directly. A lot of the work that I do at AFSA is really engaging with communities and thinking on how do we disrupt cycles of violence in a meaningful way. And that certainly looks like supporting our clients. Many of the clients that we serve at AFSA or I served at Legal Aid are often not, this isn't their first abusive relationship or the first interaction with violence. So certainly tertiary or you know violence with folks that are or have experienced violence already, uh, but also thinking about how do we disrupt cycles of violence and have conversations in um, accessible, uh, both language and other, and culturally grounded conversations with communities mm -hmm. around um, healthy relationships and normalized conversations around consent and even mental health. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much. I do have some follow-up questions on that, but before we get to that, I would like to also give um, Bronwyn a chance to tell us a little bit about the work that you do and what led you to where you are now. Thank you. <clears throat> um, I'm very lucky to work at the Texas Advocacy Project and um, always knew that I wanted to work there when I was a undergraduate student here at UT. Mm. Um, I was working at a daycare about a quarter mile from here, the first English Lutheran church in daycare, and I was studying plan two. And one of the mothers asked me what I wanted to do when I graduated, and I said, well, I'm gonna go to UT Law to be an advocate for women. And she said, do you know who I am? And, or what I do, I knew who she was. Um, and she said, <laughs> I'm the executive director of the Women's Advocacy Project. And I was like, oh, this is great. So I started volunteering there before law school, and I clerked there during law school, and just connecting with her and everything about it um, really resonated with me because there is no other place like Women's Advocacy Project, which we now call Texas Advocacy Project, to acknowledge that abuse happens to everyone. Um, and that word advocacy has always resonated with me. We talk about it sometimes at our agency that it's hard to define um, and spell and people don't always understand what it means, but it, it definitely meant a lot to me um, and I feel like the agency was pretty much designed to be a dream place for me to work. Um, I did interview at other places when I was in law school like you're supposed to do. Um, I'll never forget, I interviewed with the American Bar Association's Commission for Domestic Violence, and their director at the time, um, Robin Rung, he was interviewing me, and she said, okay, so you want to advocate for women, yes, domestic violence? I said, yes, and she said, okay, what are you doing to help survivors at your law school? And it had not occurred to me to have an answer to this question or that there were survivors at my law school. And I've never forgot that moment where I bombed that interview. And I will never forget <laughs> that in any room you're in, there are survivors around you everywhere you go. There are survivors in this room. And Leslie, thank you for sharing that you're a survivor of, um, of domestic violence as a child. Um, so, you know, that really benefited me and I've been able to bring that to my work at Texas Advocacy Project. Um, and the work that we do there, uh, we serve um, the entire state of Texas, um, essentially as a nonprofit law firm um, and more. We um, are in a way the, the law firm for the domestic violence shelters and family crisis centers around the state, especially those that don't have lawyers on staff, which is the vast majority of them. We do have a network of legal aids. Y'all know about legal aid. We have the second largest legal aid in the country is here um, serving this area, Texas Rio Grande Legal Aid. Um, but they 
can only serve, you know, some people say as few as one fifth of the people that come to them or as many as one half. Um, so there's a huge justice gap there and we seek to fill that at least for survivors of interpersonal violence. So it's so important to me um, that we never turn anyone away at Texas Advocacy Project. Um, so a lot of what I do now is try to figure out how can we be really creative and um, be very efficient and um, make sure that we're providing the highest level of service we can to as many people as possible. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. I, I think I, I wanna just bring attention to what you said earlier. You, know, you look around and there are many of us that are survivors. Some of us feel comfortable sharing that. Some of us don't and, and may never will. Um, how do we begin to really talk about intimate partner violence and, and what does it look like? I think there are many PSAs out there that maybe make it look like it's only one thing. Um, Zara, I'll ask you the question, what can intimate partner violence look like? What are the different iterations of it? Yeah, I feel like this audience might know, there's a lot of TCFE folks in the audience, but you know, when we talk about IPV, we want to make sure that a lot, in a lot of community settings, we ask folks what domestic violence looks like or interpersonal violence looks like, and folks go to the physical, and that's an important part of the conversation, but it's certainly not the only way folks can experience violence. So as we talk about power dynamics in a relationship or one person exerting power to control another person in the relationship, um, you know, we have to think beyond, beyond the physical, and uh, that certainly includes emotional violence, financial abuse. In, in immigrant spaces, we include uh, using someone's immigra immigration status against them as financial abuse in that relationship. Um, and we talk about sexual violence and how that shows up in relationships. One of the early things I did, we used to do refugee orientations down um, in Caritas. Um, and that program had, uh, has winded down since then. And uh, I talked about marital rape in, in that uh, setting and we received a call on our hotline uh, uh, on you know just someone saying that, hey, I didn't know that I had the right to consent if I'm in a long-term relationship with the same person. Um, that you know, so sc this idea of like scope of consent and mm. uh, the ability to retract consent even in a long-term relationship. So I think those are some of the things that that I would certainly start with, and I I know there's other folks that can add. Yeah. So. Would any does would anybody like to add to what Zara said? What are the top misconceptions or, or myths surrounding that, perhaps that's, yeah, go ahead, Krista. I thought about that one, and I thought about how to answer that in two minutes, so I was like, you got to really think about it, Krista, and only say one of the things. And my, I think one of the biggest myths or misconceptions is that there is some level of ease in leaving mm -hmm. a violent situation mm -hmm. or an abusive situation. Um, I know, you know, in doing trainings, you know, still to this day, but um, early on, you know, one person said, well, there's, there's free housing for DV victims. And I was like, where is this housing you speak of? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so this idea, this misconception that for people that are fleeing abuse, for people that are poor, for people that have legal needs, that there is some sort of adequate level of resource and support available is completely untrue. Um, and this idea that I think also associated with this myth of the ease of leaving is that it completely uh, erases the fact that there is a substantial real financial cost associated with leaving. And so all of us that have ever moved understand that there's costs with any kind of relocation, even if you do it with everybody that's in the household at the time, but particularly if you go from two to one, um, that's just real basic math. Like you've lost half of your financial resources and your support, and most likely if you're in an abusive context, that person is still actively trying to sabotage your ability to become economically stable. And so, I think that we do a huge disservice when we even don't speak up because it's not like somebody's saying something that's like maybe even totally biased, but when they make a comment or about like 
immigrants like having access to a bunch of public benefits and free stuff. And it's like, that's just simply not true. And to continue to purport that and let those sort of myths go uh, um, unchecked um, allows us to continue to be at the status quo and continue to diminish those supports that are so desperately needed for people that are trying to get safe and that need support like that. Um, there should be free housing for victims of domestic violence. We would greatly reduce domestic violence and go far for prevention if we had that. Mm -hmm. um, but the fact is it doesn't exist. And so I think that the concept of the ease or it's like this no cost, like just leave, um, is is one of the biggest myths. Yeah, Bronwyn, Dr. Wood, I'd, I'd like to hear a little bit more about individually in your fields, what, what some of the common misconceptions are from the legal point and also is looking at the data and research. Um, well, I would love to build on the points that Zara and Krista made because um, when we understand that abuse isn't just physical, and we understand that there's many reasons why somebody might not be able to leave an abusive relationship, um, I'd like to correct the myth that um, leaving is the end. Leaving is the most dangerous time for a victim of domestic violence. We have studies to prove your risk of being murdered greatly increase in the days, weeks, and months after you seek help to get out of that relationship. So it's not as easy as calling the police or going to a shelter um, or even filing for divorce. Um, there, there is a real risk attached to leaving. And at Texas Advocacy Project, that's one of the reasons that we feel so strongly that legal services need to be available. Um, a legal service like a protective order, which sometimes other people call restraining order, but in Texas, a protective order is that stay away order that says somebody has hurt you has to stay away is the only remedy that's been shown to correlate with a decrease in interpersonal violence. So those protective orders are just a piece of paper. They're not 100% effective, but they're the most effective thing we have. Um, so leaving is a very dangerous time for people, and legal services can save lives. So from a data perspective, I think kind of underscoring psychological violence is the most common form of violence that happens. Mm. But what I think is probably something that we don't talk about enough that kind of just feeds into a lot of what we've been talking about here is we don't talk enough about coercive control. And I think it, we've, a lot of people, probably because they don't think about domestic violence all the time, like I do, um, <laughs> probably don't think a lot about coercive control, which is a unique type of psychological violence that's really about monitoring, surveilling, threatening somebody. It explains a lot of how violent relationships, harmful relationships happen. How the dial gets turned up, how that, you know, the, the frog in the water, right? Uh, it, it explains how somebody engages in this relationship that is a loving relationship, that is an exciting relationship, and, it, and how the relationship transforms and how it maintains kind of a level of threat and violence. So. Um, you know, again, from a data perspective, some of the most impactful things to health, from a public health perspective, are psychological violence and coercive control. Um, so I think part of the misconception I would like folks to address is really understanding coercive control. And I think that also helps us understand why folks can't easily leave. There's the economic coercion element of it, but there's also, alongside of that, all of the psychological things that are happening for folks that are making it difficult for them to leave, and when they do leave, um, making it hard for them to gain and maintain any kind of safety. So I think, you know, I mean, when you look at a prevalence study, you'll see anywhere from 50 to 70 percent of survivors have experienced really intense physical violence. But nearly 90, and sometimes up to 99%, have experienced coercive control, psychological abuse, and economic abuse. So I think really understanding the full spectrum of violence and really understanding coercive control is one of our challenges as folks out engaged in the community, because coercive control tactics are what people talk about casually among friends. They're the kinds of toxic things young people might mention. They're the kinds of things that make people uncomfortable, a friend might say. Um, they're the things that people might more easily share. So if we learn to pick up on coercive control, I think it helps us understand and communicate with our friends and loved ones about domestic violence. 
Yeah, thank you for that. Dr. Wood, can you give some examples of, of what some of those things might be? Yeah, checking on someone's text messages, uh, limiting their access to friends and family. Mm -hmm. I often say, you know, connection is the antidote to abuse. Mm -hmm. What uh, somebody who's using power and control wants to do is keep somebody isolated. Uh, connection, remaining kind of in connection, whether it's at work or with friends and family is, is the antidote to that. So I, uh, tactics that promote isolation, um, keeping track of somebody where they're at, monitoring their location. I'm sure all of us could come up with a lot more. I'm just, at, I'm using some of the questions we use on our surveys most often, but really mm -hmm. things that are meant to, uh, and also things that are meant to demean and threaten somebody, mm -hmm. put downs, name calling, um, and definitely controlling somebody's economic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I almost oh, want to take us back to the basics, but if someone wanted to add to that, I can pause. Um, you know, I think, I think you mentioned it just a little while ago. I think that one of the things that I confront a lot is that people think that if I'm highly educated of, or of a, so, a certain socioeconomic status, then I'm not a survivor. And that makes it really difficult for folks that are experiencing violence to even name the violence that's happening to them or identify as a survivor. So I do want to say that, you know, unfortunately, uh, some of the things that work in other settings as protective factors are not protective factors against domestic violence. Um, so again, you know, those everyday conversations that we're having, it, it is important to normalize that violence can happen to any one of us, and it does not speak to, um, you know, uh, it, it, you know, sur a survivor is me or anybody else in this space. So I think normalizing that. And I think a second piece of it is that while we serve male survivors, gender-based violence does impact disproportionately women and uh, folks that are, don't identify on the gender binary. So also recognizing that uh, a lot of communities that are facing violence and often are left with little recourse are folks, you know, transgender folks, transgender people of color, um, folks that I you know, are on the LGBTQIA+. Um, so, so really just thinking about all the ways that people, that access is difficult, and how do you create space for those conversations, right? Yeah, thank you so much for that. I, and I'd like to expand a little bit more on that. You know, I think right now, especially in 2023 and, and some of the legislation that you mentioned, it has been an incredibly difficult time for communities of color, for people who identify as immigrants, who, uh, you know, also, like you said, people in the LGBTQIA plus community. Can you share a little bit more on how each of your individual work really expands on each other's and sort of this, this symbiotic relationship that's happening between all of you to help survivors. Go ahead. So uh, one thing I wanted to say is that while dating violence, domestic violence can happen to anybody, if you have multiple marginalized identity positions, the impact of that violence is going to be more intensive. Your barriers to getting support are going to be more intensive. And the, your ability to access economic remedies is going to be more limited because of systemic oppression. So while we say this can happen to everybody, it disproportionately impacts people of color, trans folks, so it's just real, and you, that bears out in the homicide data when you look at who experiences IPV homicide in this country. Um, all of our COVID studies at Center for Violence Prevention, uh, black women experienced the most severe violence, IPV, intimate partner violence during COVID in all of our samples at CVP uh, and had the highest lethality risk. So I, I think that's just really important to keep in mind. Um, I'm a mixed methods researcher, so I do survey data, I do longitudinal studies, I do RCTs, but I also do a lot of qualitative work. And one thing I love about working with TCFV is they really honor and respect the narratives of the rich narratives that you get from that work. So um, we've been working together for five or six years on a series of four different studies collecting data about survivors' experiences across the state. And those are some studies I've led and some studies I've just supported, you know, a lot of, a lot of different data coming in. But that, that whole pool of data recently translated into some policy change. And what's nice about working with TCFB um, and, and actually 
we collected data at both of your organizations <laughs> for, for several of these projects. What's nice about that is, uh, you know, there's limitations to what I know as a researcher, right? I can analyze data, I can interpret it to the extent that in my positionality I understand it. But when I go to a policy wonk and say, oh, here, here's the data, all of a sudden it's transformed into potential legislation. And I'm like, how did that happen? Oh my gosh. Or I take it to APSA and they're innovating so fast on their programming. I'm like, wait, wait, we haven't even evaluated it yet. But they're already moving light years ahead, right? TAP has virtual legal clinics. You know, because it came up a needs assessment. <laughs> you know, I mean, they work so fast. So it's it's really great for me to have the opportunity to have a you know to learn and to benefit from all the work they're doing, but also to have help with the what does it mean and what do we do next. So I really get my ideas from them. Like, I, sure, I have some okay ideas on my own, but nothing is better than what comes from the field. Thank you so much. Yeah, tell us a little bit more, Krista, on how your work is really impacting the other organizations as well. Yeah, um, and I, just to lift up a consistent theme that we've heard, I think that a really huge myth, and it comes up in policy, and it is in part the domestic violence movement's fault because of the narrative we've pushed. Um, is that domestic violence is a silo and it will be solved by solving issues for survivors of domestic violence that are neatly carved out and cut into this place. Whereas um, any, any bias, any oppression, any structural oppression that exists allows domestic violence to persist and it makes it much more difficult. And so I think that we are starting to see some of the unfortunate um, impacts of not making those connections fully with the general public and lawmakers because we wanted so bad to be people to be sympathetic to the issues of domestic violence survivors um, and we didn't want to make it messy or complicated. And then you see something like House Bill 4 that's being um, heard in this special session. It's already made it through the House. It's going to be heard in a Senate committee on Wednesday. And it's news to folks that criminalizing entry without inspection or unlawful entry um, and giving peace officers, which is a very broad term, not just law enforcement that we think of, but very broad um, spectrum of, of officials, the entitlement and the authorization to arrest someone for a criminal offense for how they entered this country um, and or to take them to a port of entry to remove them. And the fact that we have to make a connection that that will have a chilling impact on safety and help seeking behaviors on the part of victims of domestic violence and a whole host of other crimes and not just immigrants. And it will only embolden abusers and not just citizen abusers. It will uh, embolden an undocumented abuser that came over without inspection with their partner alike because they'll say, oh, you want to call the police? You're going to get arrested. Or I'll get arrested. And then me, the father of your children who has the job and pays for everything, is going to go to jail and then get deported. So think about that reality. And so we've, we've really disconnected sort of what supports violence prevention from the reality. And now we're having to tell a very difficult story at a very bad time. And just to be a little ominous, because tis the season, um, um, and it's specifically with this session. Um, we've come to a point, particularly in, in our state legislature, where data doesn't matter, where facts don't matter. Um, not always, but in many, many spaces, if you're appealing to us, if you're, if you're on a hot button issue, um, all of which are human issues. Um, it 
does the science, the facts, the research does not matter. Um, and that is an incredibly difficult situation that we haven't worked hard enough over the last 20 years like the other side has to not let that become what it is and just be the obvious like, well, of course, the Texas legislature is not going to do anything about guns even after Uvalde. Mm -hmm. Like, how did we get here? And so I just think that there's so much that in having survivor stories, because even if you don't speak to the data, if the data doesn't speak to you, maybe a story that is relevant to you might, or, or just basically an ivory tower of PhDs that say it might speak to you more than a survivor of domestic violence might speak to you as a policy maker. Um, and certainly lawyers um, have a level of clout and also I think that all, like the legal services and just the knowledge of the law and to be able to also wield that as a weapon on our side is incredibly powerful. So I think there's just so much that we all do together to help reshape narratives and to combat all of the myths. Um, and, and it's going to take all of us and all of you and all of everybody to start to push back on where we are right now because it's it's a very very dark space mm -hmm. yeah. my mind is racing because there's so much to share but i i do think that i think that it takes all of us to be able to minimize harm i feel like with this last led session um there there's an like an immense amount of stuff that um you know, that needs testimony and research and, you know, legal lawyers. And um, so I think that it does take all of us to be able to have those conversations. Um, one less um, of a downer thing I'll share is that, uh, or maybe it is really depressing in itself, is that we had the first uh, Korean language testimony on the House floor with an interpreter present but with TCFEs. Um, at, uh, I think y'all were around for that one, but also uh, there's a statewide uh, coalition of um, domestic violence survivors that is a survivor serving organizations that is Asian and immigrant facing and an organization out of um, Houston that's working on language access. But the, you know, that's really wonderful that 2023 was the year when we had uh, non English testimony with an interpreter on the floor and that would not be possible without a lot of people that are in this room and that are here on the stage um, advocating for that um, on, um, on the floor. Um, some of the other things that I think that we're really thankful to partner with uh, Krista and her team and with the TCFE and our other state coalition, TASA, which is the Sexual Violence uh, Survival Coalition, is including sort of language accessibility and services across the board and advocating for that. Um, Vietnamese is the third most widely spoken language in Texas, with Arabic following that. Um, and so, but there aren't a lot of, um, you know, resources that are available in those languages. We serve folks in 39 different languages last year. Mm -hmm. um, and so continuing to talk about language access, but also how do you get do dollars allocated for, for that, right, when there's a small pool of dollars to begin with. Um, another thing that I think that we really rely on this, um, this panel uh, in the work that they do to highlight is uh, disaggregated data. Data, you know, is important, and with Asian communities, a lot of times, uh -huh. uh, you know, the Asian community is not a monolith, but that's how we collect data on the Asian community. Um, and so there's not a lot of understanding on which, you know, I grew up in Pakistan, and I did not think of myself as an Asian person until I came to the U.S., so it's very much a political identity, which makes a lot of sense for us to come together, a lot of shared, um, interests and need to advocate for each other and, and power and numbers, but it does mean that, you know, for uh, the South Asian or the East Asian folks that came with a level of education earlier in the cycle of migrations and have done well are uh, skewing the data for everybody else, right? We see a large population of new immigrants, of refugees uh, that are in need of services, but that's, there's not a lot of um, we can't point to good data on that. And so advocating for how agencies at the federal level and state level 
can continue to push for data that's more specific, because that is necessary. I, as I, if I take it back to AAPI, Asian American Pacific Islander communities, um, it, is, it completely glosses over the challenges that those communities are facing. I say language access is a big problem for Asian American communities. That is not a problem for Pacific Islanders, but preservation of culture and language in, in homes is really important and is leading to uh, risk factors um, that communities are facing. So um, a lot of the work we do would be anecdotal without researchers uh, mm -hmm. helping us gather that data, analyze that data, understand that this means something and can get yeah. us somewhere. And of course, TAP and AFSA are um, often co-advocates on cases. Many, we, a lot of our clients, of course, seek legal services. And uh, so being able to refer to legal aid, but also have um, an organization that can serve folks that are um, in need of those services is really, really important and valuable and would, and keeps our communities safer. Yeah. Would you like to add a little bit more about um, certainly. I, the way that our organizations are connected is innumerable. There, there are so many times where I'm reaching out to um, the women up here and the groups up here. Um, I'll say that as a legal service provider, it is imperative for us to acknowledge that our clients have higher level needs. Someone's not going to be able to partner with me and work to get that protective order or get that divorce if they don't have housing or if they don't have food. Um, so it would be ignorant for me to just think, you know, legal services is all somebody needs. So we're always partnering with advocates, um, like the advocates at AFSA and at the agencies that belong to TCFE to make sure that the survivors that we work with are wrapped in services. Um, in the same way we like to partner with culturally specific groups um, like AFSA to educate our attorneys and make sure that our clients have the support and the sensitivity that they need. But we also know that most survivors of intimate partner violence may never access services from a shelter. So that's one of the ways that we're also trying to be creative and find survivors where they are. Um, so one thing that we um, consulted with Dr. Wood on recently is making sure that we're collecting the right kind of data to show the impact of our services to funders. So this is some way by funding research um, so you understand just for example the impact um, of stress on people's health. If I'm able to collect from all our clients, um, you know, what kind of stress are you experiencing before our services and what kind of stress are you experiencing after our services? This is really oversimplifying it. but. I could show, oh, our legal services was a reduction in stress. Then I can plug into all this data. Is this is how you taught us, right, Dr. Wood? I think I've got it right. <laughs> I can show, hey, if you fund our legal services, then you also are helping people prevent all of these other, you know, health effects. So, um, using data like that can help us be more appealing to a broader array of funders. So our agency is not going to be constantly dependent on state grants and federal grants that are very limiting and restrictive. If you get a grant from the state of Texas right now, it's going to say a lot about immigration. It's going to say you cannot provide services to people who are undocumented. It's going to put a, an income restriction on those services that you can provide. Only the poorest of the poor are deserving of your free legal services. Well, with intimate partner violence, you've learned it can happen to anybody absolutely anybody. All the abuser needs is some kind of vulnerability. Um, and let's say there is a lot of assets in a relationship, but maybe because of the abuse or the course of control, the survivor doesn't have access to the bank account or the credit card. Well, we want them to still be able to come to TAP, so we have to go look for outside funding. We can't be grant restricted. So data helps us do that. Thank you so much for sharing that. We are coming up on time, and I would like to give the audience a chance to ask some questions. But, but before we get to that, um, you know, one, one big takeaway is, again, really putting into perspective this political climate that we are in in 2023. You said it earlier. Um, oppression makes domestic violence and interpersonal violence more persistent. I think there are a lot of oppressive laws that are currently going through, not only Texas, but really around the country help is getting politicized, you know, the idea that maybe helping immigrants or undocumented folks, and it's leading to really 
dangerous impacts. With, with that landscape in mind, how can people help? What, what, how can we support you? How can we support your work? How we, can we support survivors and folks who, are, who, who need you? Well, just to piggyback on what Bronwyn was just talking about, I think that there is a huge need for, for resources without strings, both for the groups that are serving and advocating on behalf of survivors, um, because governmental grants do, do not allow you to advocate at the legislature. We have to use like our 3% of unrestricted dollars to, to fund all of our advocacy at the legislature. So, so simply um, not just donating to our organizations and say, you know, which is, would be great and becoming a member of TCFE would be great, but also um, like helping us because people that are in the business community, I'm like the dumbest person in America on like making money from like corporations. Sometimes like there's probably corporations out there and groups that would just like throw money at us unrestricted and some groups have like figured this out, but we haven't, because we're busy like trying to like stop the Texas legislature from doing something terrible. So, like any expertise in that is to like help us to grow as organizations, like Tap was saying, like so that we can get in more of those dollars that free us up to do the work that survivors really need. And I think that I'm gonna just softball over to Dr. Wood, and I think that the same goes for survivors when, when all of the type of help and assistance is coming through some, some flow of governmental grant, then it is restricted to maybe who you're serving, but also how you can serve those people. And so we know that survivors and Free From, which is an organization out of LA that did a national survey of survivors about how much would it take for you to get safe in a month. And they all said around that the average was about seven hundred and fifty dollars, which is extremely mm. affordable. It's way more affordable than a shelter for a month or than a prison, and so. But it is almost impossible to be able to just give a survivor of domestic violence $750 to go do what they need to do with it to be safe and feel stable that day. And so that also is, is something that's a huge need. Yeah. Would anyone else like to share what are, what are some ways that we can support you? Well, um, we got a grant last week from the Office on Violence Against Women to study the use of flexible funding in Harris County because they did get some unrestricted money to do that. Uh, so stay tuned for, for more information on that uh, in about two years. But <laughs> there's, so I think that there's doom and gloom, but there's also, one thing I really, as a researcher, there's so much innovation happening at the local program level, and there's amazing things happening at the federal level as well. I mean, the fact that I was able to get this study funded from Office on Violence Against Women is, is pretty incredible, but um, I think there is this idea of partnerships. So technology offers us so much in terms of being able to reach survivors. And Bronwyn made this incredible point about most people don't come to services, right? Um, so things like a TikTok reel provides a lot of education to young people about violence. So really, if we can uh, get in partnership, so even if folks don't want to give us money, if they want to give us some time, if we can get in partnership, particularly with, with tech and with, I mean, you know, Mike Mackert's group down, down the road that does amazing health comms work, really refining some of our messages, um, you know, uh, talking about getting prevention and some of our dialogue about dating violence into the virtual realm in a way that is accurate, in a way that is supportive, in a way that is survivor-centered. That means partnering with tech. It means partnering with people who know how to do advertising on social media, stuff I do not know how to do. And if I ever get on TikTok, I think my teenager will die. Um, but really, using a lot of partnerships to take our practice knowledge, our policy, our research findings, and disseminate them into untraditional sources. We don't get to do prevention in the schools as much as we want to anymore, but we can do it online. We can do it through social media. We can do it through digital hotline like Safe Alliance has. So there's a lot of opportunities for partnership that will help us reach survivors, and importantly, reach survivors who aren't gonna come traditional dating violence services.
Yeah. Um, I would like to ask everybody here to just continue working to end the stigma around domestic violence. I know that, you know, sometimes if you feel like someone close to you is experiencing that, it's really tempting to say, oh, that's a private issue, that's very personal, I'm going to let them take care of it. But isolation, as you've learned, is what feeds intimate partner violence. It really can happen to anyone, so letting people know, you know, that you care about them, you're scared for them, you're here to help when they're ready, um, can really um, go a long way. So if, if it's something that you know, you're here tonight that we can talk about more, that people shouldn't be ashamed of, um, because a lot of survivors will tell you they feel deeply ashamed. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the abuse, is to make them blame themselves. That's a form of emotional abuse. So letting them know, this isn't your fault, this can happen to anyone. I care about you, I'm scared for you, I'm here to help you when you're ready, um, can be really powerful. And then also, please vote. Um, there's a case in front of the Supreme Court in a week, um, US v. Brahimi, where our justices are gonna determine if we're gonna continue a federal mandate that people who've been found to be abusive shouldn't have firearms for a specific period of time. This law saves lives. And it is not the law here in Texas anymore because we live in the Fifth Circuit where there are more conservative judges than any other circuit in the United States because there were more judges appointed in the last administration than any other circuit in the United States. So that election impacted us here in Texas. We don't have the same rights as the rest of the states right now. Abusers can have guns in our state. Um, and so we're about to find out in a week if that's gonna be the law everywhere. I'm very hopeful about it, um, but please vote. I, I mean, we definitely need the unrestricted dollars, but I won't belabor that point. Um, I will say that I think half conversations, right? I think that yes. we've talked about being in community as being a protective factor, maybe one of the only ones that we can point to. Um, and people don't want to call a hotline and talk about their relationship, right? Uh, they want to talk to the person sitting next to them. Um, in their workplaces, people in congregational spaces, wherever people gather. So I think uh, having conversations is, you know, we talk about prevention work and it gets so technical because so many of our grants don't want to fund prevention. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. out of an 11 person outreach team, I have two half people that can do prevention work. But we, we really need all of us to do prevention work, right? And prevention really just looks like normalizing conversations around yes. violence. and. Um, what Krista said earlier about, you know, when, it, it, when, when there are additional risk factors, violence is harder to escape. And so, you know, when, you know, we saw a rise of Asian hate during the pandemic and, but th that wasn't the first time that folks have experienced xenophobia in America, right? We, uh, there's a rise in Islamophobia, anti-Semitism. These are all things that are related to how we experience violence and how communities heal from trauma. And so calling out when you're a witness to it um, is really important, and I know it's really uncomfortable, um, but I think that you know, really normalizing conversations, and a lot of times people, you know, when they're talking, you know, language is gendered and language is violent, and I think that we have to unlearn some of those things, and so really there is no way that that can be the job of only the professionals that, uh, have the opportunity, and we're really, you know, honored to be doing this work. But we need the community to have those conversations. And um, so I, I say, initiate a conversation with, with someone. Yeah. Thank you so much to all of you. I'd like to open up the space now. If anybody has any questions that they would like to ask of our panelists. Yeah, I believe there's um, microphone there. <laughs> Hi, my name is Brianna. I just want to say thank you so much for your work. I imagine it can probably be quite scary, so thank you. Um, on the prevention, do you guys noodle on like root cause with the abuser? And is it like too controversial to wonder if there were services for them? And so it's for both sides. And that is there like a before and after, so they're not just carrying that title and then the survivor gets out and then it just keeps going. So uh, I think the noodling point, yeah. So I think our task, uh, 
especially in, in the research community that I'm part of, is really to focus on, on research focused on not only violence primary prevention, so stopping it from ever happening in the first place, but working with harm doers, working with folks that have experienced, that are using violence and harm um, on innovative and new strategies. So as a research community, we have not spent as much time working on things like batterers intervention and prevention as we should have. Um, really, the most exciting work in prevention of violence and harm is happening on the primary prevention front and the secondary prevention front with youth. But I want to underscore something that Krista touched on earlier, that when we talk about root causes of violence and we talk about violence prevention, some of the most impactful violence prevention strategies are economic and policy in nature. So housing, childcare, these are really important violence prevention strategies and they're perpetration prevention strategies because of the uh, way that, that generational cycles of violence and harm and oppression permeate in communities, these economic remedies are really important. I will say, though, we have very many exciting primary prevention tools that prevent perpetration and prevent re-perpetration for young folks. Um, the fourth R, which we study at Center for Violence Prevention, um, at Safe Dates, I mean, there's several of them, and they've, many of them have been culturally adapted and are available to use. We just need the political will to get them implemented. Um, I, I do think where the evidence is a little fuzzier is what to do with adults who are using violence and harm. Um, some of the criminal justice remedies don't work as well as we'd like them to, though some of them work for some folks, especially folks who have something to lose from being arrested or violating their protective order. Um, but it's really the task, I think a lot of us researchers have called each other to task for not focusing enough on this, and it is really the work for, for me, it will be the work of the decade ahead of what to do about this because we just don't know enough about how to stop it once it started, particularly for adults. Thank you. Any other? Oh, we have a question. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Temi. I'm a licensed master social worker in the state of New York and Texas. Mm -hmm. um, I was just wondering, um, what you do to combat burnout. Um, you know, it's a very difficult topic, and you know, it's hard to be in the helping profession, uh, especially at this time, but um, I would think of things like community and support for each other uh, to help you through this, but, but what, what have you done to combat burnout uh, within this field? Well, as maybe the most burned out person on the stage, but it's not, it's not a burnout Olympics up here. No, um, <laughs> just right now. But I will say that one thing that um, AFSA's uh, leader, Darlene Lanham, said at something um, she was speaking at in front of a lot of TCFE staff was um, how they're really working on incorporating pleasure into their prevention work. Um, and that's something that... I, I, and I like like people. I think sometimes people like think if I'm like have a smile on my face or if I laugh or I make a joke about some TV show and then go back to talking about the statistics on domestic violence and everything, it's like I can't. What a, what a horrible person! But like we have to be able to interject like our whole selves and our whole like and the good that really is like even just in like in a like one of the most important things for like working well with people that do harm is recognizing that we have a. Most people that do harm do something really well. Yes. That like, yes. like if and if we celebrated that a little bit more, maybe like they wouldn't. You know, like I just think that we we need to sort of celebrate and enjoy and get together in community and be okay with um, having fun and being creative and finding outlets for pleasure and not letting sort of this idea that we should be feel really guilty about that or that um, it's not appropriate because of the issue that we're talking about. Um, I think it's absolutely necessary. Um, I think the times that we are in now, if we only focus on exactly what is going on, like none of us should even have been able to get out of bed today. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we have to find those things that, like, we can just 
like celebrate as like this is what is really golden in humanity and and allow that for ourselves and each other. Yeah, I would just, yes, absolutely. Joy is radical in ways that you never yes. thought. Um, the other thing I would say is that, you know, in, and we were kind of giggling up here because it's something that, you know, we were faced in a really sort of real way during the pandemic, but also is constantly something that we should be prioritizing uh, as organizations, as individuals, as folks that are supporting uh, people in community that are excited to do this work or are for survivors. I think one thing that we've heard from our staff also is a living wage. Yes. It is not, uh, you know, is, is we, people are not doing this work because they, you know, it's easy, right? And we live in Austin and uh, the cost of living in the last eight years that I've been here has, mm -hmm. you know, has skyrocketed, right? And so, um, We've worked a lot to, in addition to making sure that there's opportunities for folks to come together and community and support, that people don't need side gigs to live in Austin, right? And I don't know that we're there, you know, fully, but we have prioritized uh, living wage raises, not, you know, dependent on performance, living wage raises, wages across the agency. Uh, and, and we hope to be able to fund that every year um, and continue to raise because the cost of living is going up, but also recognizing that people have, you know, school, you know, tuition and rents and, you know, cars because our public transport system is not what it should be. So, so that's something that we're also thinking about. How do we make it sustainable for somebody? Great question. Yes, go ahead. Hi, um, I'm Terry Langford. I'm the oh. Health and Human Services Editor at Texas Tribune. I have a question for you, Bron Bronwyn. You had mentioned that the state has, and I think all of you chimed in on this, uh, the state has strict parameters on who you can help. Um, has that been something that has gotten worse over time or something that's always been? And can you talk a little bit more about that? Yes, thank you for that question. Um, you know, in almost any time that we receive a grant or other people receive a grant, there there are going to be restrictions on how you use that money. And um, my colleagues pointed out even that one big restriction might be that, okay, you need to use this money for direct services. Um, so even that, you know, you might think, well, that's pretty innocuous. That's not saying there's an immigration restriction or an income restriction, although many of our grants certainly have those. Um, but saying, okay, that has to be on direct services. Well, what that can do to a nonprofit is crippling because it might mean that we can't use any of our money for outreach or development or policy work, um, which is also very important. So um, our agency has been very fortunate um, and we, we really appreciate our government funding, but we combine it um, with, with other sources of funding. So we've, we've become very strong and stable by using a braided funding system and making sure that we're reaching our government funders, private foundations, as well as private individuals. And all of those funds are earmarked in different ways and um, have different strengths. I haven't noticed um, a change in how our government grant restrictions play out. Um, it, there are some that have come up recently. Um, for example, um, we did have funding from the state of Texas now that says, okay, you cannot, um, diversity is definitely coming up. And you, you've seen this here at the University of Texas. Some of our funding has said, okay, you cannot be using this funding for any kind of DEI training um, and things like that. So there's some winds in Texas sometimes that blow and they say, okay, you have to be very careful about how you're using your money or, or what you're even saying about the use of it. Um, so all of our state agencies and people funded by state agencies might experience that. Okay, we probably have time for one more question. Yes. This. I don't know whether the 88th legislative session will ever be over, uh, but assuming that it is over and we get to the 89th session, um, one of the, it, it seems that the abortion ban bill looks like it has some room to reduce some re restrictions. Um, and I'm wondering whether you all would um, wager on whether 
-hmm. uh, folks who, who um, suffer from domestic violence and, then, and rape and incest then become pregnant and want an abortion, whether that will change in the state of Texas. We've had conversations in advance of the 88th because, you know, abortion became illegal in Texas prior to January of 2023 because of our, our trigger law. Um, and it's a really delicate conversation because I think something I mentioned earlier is, you know, what the way we prevent domestic violence is not by just continuing to say, well, this if we could let protect victims of domestic violence or let victims of domestic violence get this, which is so incredibly important. Like there's no one would no one would fault us for supporting like like abortion access for domestic violence victims, sexual assault victims and incest victims. And um, we started to have some of those conversations. And then what came up was like, well, just what kind of proof would people have to show? And it just goes back into all of these things where it's like real victims and people that access the criminal legal system. Um, or, and so it's just, a, I feel like it's a slippery slope, particularly in that because uh, the abortion ban obviously affects all of us, and particularly more so people with uteruses um, that have significantly less rights um, here in Texas, not just because we can't get an abortion, but also because once you become pregnant, your civil rights really diminish. Um, and so I think that that I think where we need to stand with that and we need all of everyone to stand with us on is just a united front that this is not how, this is not a law that we want here. Like this is, this is ludicrous. Um, the majority of Texans don't agree with it. Um, but how do we get to a place where the majority of the populace's opinion actually influences the policymakers' opinions? And so I think that that's, as a policy person, is a, is a, is a challenge. And looking into the 89th session, which I do tout myself on some psychic abilities, but unfortunately I don't think it looks like super shiny um, <laughs> looking into 2025. But I, I, yeah, I just think that's really tricky. And I think that that's something that we've all internally talked about, about like, do we want to try to say that like these types of people could maybe enjoy an abortion, you know, as opposed to someone else, somebody else that doesn't have that right. Like, while the right is still precluded from, from everybody else, I think that it's just a tricky conversation, but we should continue to have it. Yeah, it's thank you. Less oh. than 50% of the voting public who had registered to vote vote. Your idea that getting people to vote is really, really important. Yeah. Yeah. Good job, Brett. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for your time as well. Um, our panelists will be around for a few more moments if there are still some questions that you would like to ask them. Ronan, Zara, Krista, Dr. Wood, thank you so much for the work that you are doing, the work you continue to do, and thank you so much for sharing a little bit more on really expanding this conversation. This is a very important conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Mm-hmm.